Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 212, the last one of 2020, Myth Movie Night with Over the Moon. I regret that we weren't able to do this around mid-autumn because that is really when the movie takes place, but I am glad that we got to it for the end of the year because I think it is a great story. I think it's a great movie and it's very sweet and it's one that we haven't touched upon yet in spirits. Absolutely. It was a really nice way to spend this last week of the year. So good selection, Jules. Plus, it's on Netflix, so everyone can kind of close out their year with a nice, feel-good Netflix movie about loss and love. You know whose Netflix always has complete uh, editions of all the shows they want to stream? Is it our new patrons? Our new patrons, Bright Valkyrie, Peggy Pegs, and Jane. Thank you so, so much for supporting this little podcast over on Patreon. A little podcast that could. That's us. We don't always say the URL, by the way. It's patreon.com slash spirits podcast if you would like to join the ranks, have your name read, and have us give you a compliment like we do every week for our supporting producer level patrons. Alicia, Allison, Deborah, Hannah, Jen, Jessica, Keegan, Nieselkins, Liz, Megan Linger, Megan Moon, Phil Fresh, Polly, Sarah, Skyla, Sam Todd, and Alex Forbes. We love all these people. I would make a homemade rocket to the moon for them. Hell yes. And thanks as well to our legend level patrons, Audra, Chelsea, Drew, Francis, Jack Marie, Key, Lada, Mark, Morgan, Necrofancy, Renegade, and BM Me Up Scotty. Now they just own the moon. Legally, they <laughs> own the moon now. A hundred percent. Julia, I hope you had a great week off. What have you been reading, watching, or listening to? So I recently saw the trailer for a Netflix series about a book series that I read a while back. So I did what any normal person would do and ordered all five books of that series and have been reading them. Hell yeah. So that is the Grisha verse by Lee Bardugo. The Netflix series that is coming out is called Shadow and Bone off of the first book in the series. It's very good. It is, I think I might have recommended it like a while back, but I'm recommending it again because I'm rereading it. But it is like magical Russia, magic users, political intrigue, saving the world. There's a saint. It's very good. That sounds absolutely amazing. You know what else is amazing, Amanda? Our fellow shows here at Multitude. It's true. It's been quite a year um, for many reasons, but one of them is that it's it's hard to be an independent media business. And I am just really proud that all of us are around and making shows and doing the stuff we love as a job, which is pretty amazing. So if you, sweet, sweet conspirator, would like to listen to more stuff or want to help us out and recommend one of the Multitude shows to a friend or family member who you think would really love it, it's a great time to do it. You can go to multitude.productions to check out all of our shows in one place or just put multitude into your podcast player and all of our shows will come up. Yeah, I'm the kind of person that one of my love languages is like, I really love this thing. So I want to share it with you. And one of the easiest things to do is recommending podcasts to other people so you can listen together and be like, oh my God, did you listen to that most recent episode of Exolore? Oh my God, let's talk about it because it's just showing that you're thinking of that person and it's a thing that you guys can talk about. Absolutely. Well, we really appreciate all of you being there. We appreciate you doing this. We appreciate that we have a whole nother year of uh, making spirits coming up. And I don't know, it's just it's a nice kind of grateful feeling to go out on and continue the work in 2021. Absolutely. So without further ado, everybody enjoy Spirits Podcast episode 212 over the moon. So Amanda, welcome back to another Myth Movie Night, one that um, within the first five minutes of the film made me cry. So <laughs> yeah, my, my cry count was at about five for this one. Mm -hmm. Somehow I forgot that uh, people don't just live uh, charming and stress-free family lives in uh, sweet animated movies. So that one was on me. That was part of it. I feel like I just haven't listened to a new musical in a while. And so the idea of like music conveying intense emotion via storytelling threw me for a loop. Oh boy. How dare they? Oh, I just miss it. I miss Broadway. I miss uh, live stage. And uh, now I'm real sad. But I do. I miss Philippa Sue, one of the stars of this movie. Yes. Oh, my God. This cast is absolutely buck wild in terms of uh, very, very impressive actors and actresses. Yeah. Sandra Oh makes an appearance. Uh, Margaret Cho makes an appearance. We have heartthrob John Cho. He's there. It's just it's incredible. It's it's honestly great. 
I just this cast is incredible. But let's uh, let's do our summary, Amanda. I believe it is your turn. It sure is. I'm going to do my best. So as usual, everybody, if you want to avoid spoilers and uh, go see the film on your own, you can skip forward about three minutes. We're going to do a two minute summary and then a little bit of a discussion afterward. Yeah. Also, like, you know, you can pause it and listen to this later if you want to watch the movie first. It's on Netflix. It's really good. It's really worth it. Okay. Amanda, are you ready? I am ready. All right. Ready, set, go. Okay, so our protagonist, Feifei, is an adorable uh, little child who grows up with adorable parents who love her. Um, and clearly, I forgot that that means that uh, one of them will die. Mm. Uh, so, in fact, we we meet her and her parents with their very sweet uh, mooncake shop. And it, it's just adorable. There's meaning. And we open specifically with Feifei's mom telling her the story of Chang'e, the moon goddess, and the fact that she was separated from her great love and is sort of like exiled to the the moon and she has her jade rabbit there with her and she you know is constantly trying to reunite with her love but it's very sad because her you know she was immortal and her love was mortal and then he died here on earth and i was like damn she just said that that she died to uh to the to the child so echoing this a little bit fei fei's mom passes away we see the passage of time and then fei fei is kind of like a like a, i don't know 12 or 13 like a very early teen or or late kid um as it were and she sort of gets frustrated that her dad is about to marry somebody new uh with a with a son named chin and she obviously is very understandable. Um, and so she basically takes inspiration from a magnetic high speed train that's being built in her village um, and then builds a rocket to take her to the moon. And even though she doesn't make it to the moon on her own, she is picked up by like a beam of energy. And sure enough, Chunga is real. She lives on the moon. She's kind of a mix of like a uh, a pop star and the Wizard of Oz. And there are all kinds of adventures as Fei Fei um, tries to help the moon goddess reunite with her love, which she does only to sort of realize that like love is letting go. And, you know, sometimes and so she lets go and Fei Fei lets go of kind of missing her mom so desperately and reunites with her family on Earth and her new brother Chin to, you know, be happy and move on and always remember her mom, but know that she has to like live her life for herself anew. Dang, like right on time. A lot of plot points in the whole, like I described the first quarter and then like the last 10%. Yeah. A lot of stuff in the middle there, um, specifically that I'm sure we're going to get into in terms of the the myth and what parts are accurate and what aren't. Um, but it's really fun. It's like a really sweet mix of, you know, sweet like rural life in China and uh, moon theatrics. So it was really fantastic. Also, if you think, oh, I can watch a movie with Ken Jeong where he sings a song and I won't cry. You will cry. In fact, you, you will. will. You will. Oh, man. But yeah, it's it's a great movie. And it has such a wonderful basis in the mythology around Chunga and the mid-autumn moon festival. So I, I just want to dive right in. Are you ready? You ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. Please. So Over the Moon focuses on the story of Feifei and her relationship with her family and their stories surrounding the moon goddess Chunga. As the movie kind of implies uh, from the various stories that the aunties tell over dinner, there are many different versions of Chunga's story, uh, some portraying her in a better light than others, which I think is uh, fairly common in a lot of mythological stories and is a result of like different gods and goddesses going in and out of style through the generations and receiving more or less worship depending on who's in power. Uh, we see that a lot with the Greeks, for example, like when a one city state would take over another city state, all of a sudden like, oh, well, we like Athena a lot more now because, you know, Athens rules us. So yeah, I think that's a pretty, pretty common thing. And especially when you look at the vast history of Chinese folklore and mythology and just Chinese history in general. However, there are some key points that the story of Chunga tend to mention or incorporate, uh, most of which we see in the film. There is her love of Hui, uh, the archer. Uh, there is usually an emperor, which we don't really see in the film. Uh, there is a elixir or pill of life or immortality, and of course, the moon. And uh, this story is, as the movie makes it clear, tied to the Mid-Autumn Moon Festival, which uh, this year was on October 1st, so unfortunately we missed it, but uh, maybe next year we'll do something to kind of uh, to commemorate that day. It actually fell on the same day this year as National Day. So it turned into like this big eight day festival, which is very cool. Like I like when different holidays kind of align yeah. with each other. Quite synchronous. But let's tell the story of Chang'e, or at least 
try to cover some of the different versions of it. So it is said that Chang'e was the beautiful young woman who worked as a servant in the Jade Emperor's palace. Now, the Jade Emperor was the first god and his heavenly palace was, of course, in the heavens, which he ruled over as well as Earth. For context, he's not the creator of heaven and Earth, but rather assisted the divine master of heavenly origin, who then chose the Jade Emperor as his personal successor. So that's that's kind of cool. A little background. That's a really interesting mix, I think, of like uh, divine selection and being good at your job, which uh, is just really resonant for me. It's like the best internship. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. So Chang'e is working in the Heavenly Palace, and one day she accidentally breaks this precious porcelain jar. And in his anger, the Jade Emperor banished her from the heavens to live on Earth. However, he told her that if she contributed a valuable service on Earth, she would be allowed back in heaven. Fair enough. I mean, a banishment is a banishment, but at least you have a sort of uh, option for renewal here. Yes, you, you have a way back in if you really wanted to. You, yeah. could, you could get back. So Chang'e, in her form on Earth, became became the beautiful but poor daughter of a farming family and lived a fairly simple life. However, one day when she was tending her crop, a young hunter named Hui spotted her hey. and introduced himself. Uh, in some stories, it's kind of like a love at first sight kind of thing. In others, they, they simply became close friends. I personally, as a fan of romance, prefer a slow build. So I go with the, the friend's first story. I'm into that. Mm -hmm. And this is all fine and well, except one day after the two have become friends, 10 sons rise into the sky instead of the usual single one. Wow. Yeah, not great. Uh, and odd in itself, but uh, as you can imagine, having 10 suns in the sky, the earth suddenly becomes very hot and the suns begin to burn the earth. I mean, not good. Not good. You, you think like, oh my gosh, what a beautiful display, and then, oh no. So it was Hui, the expert archer that he was, who came to the aid of the earth. With his bow and his arrow, he's able to shoot down nine of the suns, leaving only one remaining. Interestingly, there's this little like tidbit, like each time he shoots down a sun, it turns into a, a three-legged crow or a three-legged raven, which I'm not entirely sure what that's supposed to represent, but I think it's a cool little fun fact. There's a really beautiful motif of what looked, I mean, the thing that I've seen that's closest is a heron. I'm sure that wasn't the kind of bird that it is, but mm -hmm. like a beautiful long-legged crane, you know, white type bird. Yes, yeah, so we'll talk about the representation of what the cranes talk about later. But oh, good. Excellent. You. I was like, there's only two legs. I was counting. I knew it was going to be symbolically rich. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Thank you for, for keeping those distinct, uh, distinct imageries. Interestingly, also, there's a whole thing where Hui's like, probably going to shoot down the 10th son, but then the the mother of the son is like, please don't kill my last child. And the Jade Emperor is like, we probably need another son to make sure that, <laughs> you know, the, the world doesn't freeze. And he is like, all right, okay, fine. All right, listens to listens to stuff. I respect it. He yeah. seems great. He seems like an unproblematic fave. Mm, hold on. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, damn. He, of course, was the savior of the people and they made him king. And keeping with his streak of success, he and his childhood friend Chunga marry each other. He was living the dream. Honestly, so is Chunga. It's pretty great. You know, you're married to your best friend. He's also the king. That's awesome, right? But, you know, power changes a person, right? Uh, Hui becomes obsessed with the idea of staying alive forever and orders that an elixir of life should be created so that he can stay alive and stay young and continue to rule. Eventually, the elixir is made into the form of a single pill and Chunga finds it before it is presented to Hui. What happens next depends on which story you're hearing, uh, just like the aunties are arguing at the table in the movie, but Chunga swallows the pill. In this version where Hui is like the tyrant king, Chunga is afraid of what he might do if he was to live forever and that the people he ruled over would continue to suffer. So that's why she takes the pill so that he can't have it and he can't continue to rule. And Hui obviously is going to be extremely mad about this. And so he chases his wife, who escapes by jumping out a window of the tallest part of the palace. But rather than falling, she begins to float into the sky. And whether that is because of the immortality pill or divine intervention is, again, dependent on the story you're listening to. Most people attribute it to the pill, which is like, right. man, it lets you float. 
it grants you like immortality and eternal youth. That's pretty good. Pretty solid, honestly. Yeah, there are many kinds of immortality um, sort of uh, modifications that we see in stories. And the one that I like the most is the one where like you are constantly averting near death scenarios versus like hero style. Like you get injured and then you heal really fast or you, you know, just kind of like bounce back or you reincarnate or reset. I love the ones where it's just like, oh, nope, like this knife misses you very slightly. Or, you know, yes, you fall on a, you know, shopkeeper's awning or something very cool like that. It's like immortality through extreme luck. Exactly. Yeah. I like that a lot. So as Chunga floats up to the moon, Hui attempts to shoot her down with his arrows, but apparently his aim isn't what it used to be because he uh, just straight up misses. And she's able Damn. to float away. So Chunga arrives on the moon where she is accompanied by the Jade Rabbit, who is also already there. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and he is said to be constantly pounding the elixir of immortality for her in a large mortar. Like, she, it seems like she has to keep taking it in order to mm-hmm. stay immortal, which like the, Interesting. the movie kind of plays with. He's he's always like doing something. Yeah. In one version of the story, it is said that the Celestial Queen Mother, who I believe is supposed to be the wife of the Jade Jade Emperor, or at least has a child or children with him, she turns Chunga into a three-legged toad when she arrives on the moon as punishment, which I think the film kind of pays homage to with like those giant lunar toads that we see towards the end of the film. And also the yeah. fact that like Chin has a, a, a toad frog companion for the film, which is very Definitely. cute. It's also like the chillest frog I've ever seen in a movie. He's very chill. I know. I expected very many examples of him like shooting poison or, or you know, yelling or whatever it might be. But he was very, he was very comfortable when he was caught. He was like, fair enough. He's like, fair enough. I'm chill. And he just gives like very like, not snide looks, but just like very content with himself looks. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, listen, this is a complete side note. But every time I watch an animated movie sort of like this or in this style, I'm amazed by the nuances of expression that it manages to convey. It's it's truly so artful. It was so good. I also noticed that the eyebrow game in the animation of all the people is extremely good. Yes. No, it really is. Like Chunga's eyebrows, you can see like every individual hair of her eyebrows and they look great. Yeah. And then at the very end of the film, there is a shot involving a willow tree. And I like backed it up to watch again several times because I sort of pictured it. I think sometimes like when they were pitching this movie, you know, and got approval to do it. Because like that's the thing that I do in my job now um, with various projects. Like what was the image that made somebody say yes. And to me, if they had like painted that still with the willow tree, that would make me say like, damn, this team knows what they're doing. Okay, yes. So all of the outfits that Chunga wears in the films were actually designed and created by a hokuchur Chinese designer named Guao Pei. And I'm just oh like, my God. that is, it is so cool that you brought in an actual like hokuchur clothing designer to design all of the outfits for your goddess. That is very, very cool. That is so cool. And she definitely, like, they play with kind of um, authenticity and sort of like she is distracting herself with pomp and circumstance is kind of the implication. And then when she sort of uh, regresses emotionally almost, or, or maybe not regresses, but like comes back to her true self or like acknowledges the kind of hurt at the center of her, her costuming and her face uh, sort of revert back to what I'm assuming is the, either like what she was when she was human or what she used to be when she was younger. And that um, kind of stylistic exchange was really fascinating. Yeah, it, it, she kind of spends that final scene in a very simple simplified outfit and stuff like that and uh, no makeup or anything like that. It's really, really like beautiful, beautiful imagery. Yeah. So in the versions of the story where Hue is the tyrant, uh, this is the reason that the Mid-Autumn Moon Festival is celebrated to kind of honor the sacrifice that Chugga made so that Hue would like not live forever. So that's a reason that we, you know, celebrate. But yeah. there is another version of the tale that paints Hue in like a much better light. Uh, he kind of lives this quite uh, storied life as an adventurer after his son slaying. So he kills and imprisons several of these like fearsome mythological beasts on bequest of the uh, the king, King Yao, because they're causing problems for his kingdom and for humanity in general. And so for his services, the gods gifted Hue the pill of immortality so that he might ascend to godhood, which is like a big deal. Huge deal. Dang. 
Yeah. However, uh, one of his apprentices breaks into Hue's house to find the pill when he knows that he's out hunting. And Chunga is home at the time of the break-in and she hides the pill in her mouth. However, when the apprentice kind of threatens her, she accidentally swallows it, which once again causes her to begin to float into the sky. Right. In this version, she chooses to land on the moon and remains there because the moon is the closest like heavenly body to Earth and she wants to be close to her husband, who she still loves. Right. But when Hue discovers uh, what happened, he basically, he's just like, okay, well, my wife is on the moon now. That sucks. In her like honor and her memory, I'm going to lay out these fruits and cakes that I know she loves in order to uh, to like let her know, hey, I'm still thinking about you and I still love you too. It's very cute. I mean, every time I see or read about a an altar for a dead relative, I just uh, get teary, teary. Like it just happens every time. Yeah, and they they have that imagery in the film, which I think uh, is is really beautiful. And it uh, it factors into uh, The Duke Who Didn't, a book I recommended a few episodes ago. Ooh, fun. But this, again, is not the only version of the story either, which is kind of what I love about this kind of mythology. There's so many different versions of the same story, each with like their own moral or agenda, depending on who is telling it. And it's just fascinating and wonderful. And we'll get into the details of the other versions and some additional mythological creatures that are touched upon in the film when we get back from our refill. Let's go. Oh, Julia, thank God. I have been waiting for several months to do this Brooklyn and ad because <gasps> I love my Brooklyn and sheets so much. Aren't they great? Over Christmas, I was talking to my uncle and he was like, yeah, I just I bought some new sheets up for Lake Placid, you know, our, our grandparents house. And I was like, oh, my God, you should have told me I am completely obsessed with Brooklyn and they're a sponsor of the show. And he was like, no way. Those are the sheets I bought. Ah! So he didn't use our discount code, but you can, conspirators. It's one of those companies where you hear it and you're like, surely it can't be as good as the hype. Or, you know, I feel marketed to because they get me and my aesthetic in their ads and patterns. And I I don't know if it's actually real. It's real. These sheets are amazing. We call them the buttery soft. Like, oh, I'm going to get into the buttery soft and I just don't want to get out of bed. And it's kind of a problem. It takes a certain level of quality sheets for my husband to actively recommend to random people. And that is the type of quality of sheet that Brooklyn is providing. It is truly incredible. They don't just have sheets, by the way. They have comforters, pillows, towels, even loungewear. I bought two of their loungewear t-shirts and I've worn them to the office like every single week for the last several months. Um, So I'm going to buy myself more. It it is truly incredible. It is a sponsor we are so, so happy to have on the show. And trust me all, it lives up to the hype. So don't wait. Do something nice for yourself and go to brooklinen.com. Use the promo code SPIRITS to get 10% off your first order and free shipping. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com and enter the promo code SPIRITS for 10% off your first order plus free shipping brooklinen.com promo code spirits at checkout thank you brooklinen for giving me the buttery soft speaking of our beds and not wanting to get out of them i have been sleeping so much better since i downloaded the calm app amanda i know you've been preaching to me about how good calm is for so long since they became our sponsor and let me tell you it works it really does work It really does. And whenever I hear other podcasters do ads for Calm and they shout out the train related sleep stories, I'm like, that's right. You know what's up. So Calm is an app that helps you ease stress and get the best sleep of your life. It has a whole library of programs designed for healthy sleep, like the soundscapes and the guided meditations and the sleep stories, like the train one that Amanda loves. All of them. And if you go to calm.com slash spirits, you'll get a limited offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming. They're always adding new stuff. And over 70 million people around the world use Calm to help take care of their minds and get a better sleep. Again, for listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off the Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash spirits. That's 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library and new content is added every week, like I said. Get started today at calm, C-A-L-M dot com slash spirits. That's calm dot com slash spirits. And finally, we are sponsored by BetterHelp. 
If there is something that is on your mind this time of year or feelings you have about how the holidays may look different or what the new year might bring, it is really, really helpful to be able to talk that over with a professional therapist. And I get my therapy through BetterHelp. That is a service that lets you start communicating in under 48 hours with a therapist. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is just truly professional counseling done securely online. I love that their experts have a range of expertise. So even if you might not locally have a therapist who's specializes in whatever it is you're looking for help with, you can find that on BetterHelp. And they also make it really easy to switch counselors if you need to. That is uh, not not free or easy offline. So I really appreciate that. And it's even more affordable than traditional offline counseling. And they offer financial aid. But if you want to get started with our discount code, you can go to BetterHelp, that's better H-E-L-P dot com slash spirits to join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That is BetterHelp dot com slash spirits for 10% off your first month. And now let's get back to the show. So besides eating mooncakes, which we'll get into in a little bit, one of the traditional drinks of the mid-autumn moon festival is cassia wine, which is kind of this sort of mellow apricot or peach-like flavor. It's really nice. Uh, I'm not sure how easy it is to find in the United States, but if you find some, definitely pick it up. It's the perfect pairing for this film. Otherwise, I would suggest something with a similar flavor profile. I picked a nice rosemary, sage, and peach cocktail for this one, which I very much enjoyed. So I like the, I like the flavor of peaches. Peaches are great. And I know orange wines are very uh, like trendy right now in certain circles, but my local wine shop had a really interesting selection. So I got one that's almost like a tangerine flavor mm-hmm. profile and color, which I thought would be a pretty okay uh, analog. Nice. If you have the name of it, let me know. I will post it for our patrons. I will. So let's get into some of the other versions of the story that we see mentioned or alluded to in the movie. So the film starts off with the space dog, which is incredible. But also in the final moments of the movie, we see that Fei-Fei's family has adopted a Sharpay and named him Space Dog, which is extremely cute. I love that. It is extremely cute. Yeah, her, um, I won't spoil it, but her uh, pet rabbit's storyline is wonderful. The rabbit doesn't die, guys, don't worry. But I did cry and cry and cry. Fair enough. Yes. So the movie explains that this giant space dog, which in China is known as the Tian Go, which translates to heavenly dog, uh, somewhat true to what the film says, the creature will attempt to either eat the sun or the moon, which is why we have eclipses. It's less so what the movie says, where it's the um, the waxing and waning of the moon and more full on eclipse. But uh, the movie says that Chunga is the one that makes the dog spit out the moon. Probably not true in the actual mythology, which I will tell you now. So in some stories, the Tian Go is actually the hound of Hui. And in the Ooh. version of the story where Chunga takes the elixir for like selfish reasons, as mentioned in the movie, like uh, the one auntie who's like, she just wanted to be young forever. That's why she took the pill or both pills, because in some versions, there's two pills. It's weird. Yeah, she wanted to be away from her husband, right? And then she like makes eye contact with her husband across the room. It's yeah, and then she's like, the husband's like, well, now she's all alone with just a rabbit. And she's like, lucky her. (laughs) It's like, damn, all right, auntie. So as she floats towards heaven after taking the pill, the, quote, black-eared hound, Tiango, uh, witnesses her treachery and begins to bark at her. Chunga is kind of surprised by the barking and drops what remains of the elixir. And the dog begins to lap up the remaining drops. And he, too, begins to rise into the air after Chunga and also grows in size to, like, monstrous proportions. Oh my God, so cute. He's Clifford the big red dog, but uh, giant space Sharpe. May I suggest um, Hellhound and Space Pup? Very cute. Space Pup into it. So Chunga flees to the moon and attempts to hide there, but the dog swallows the moon and Chunga whole. Oh no. Not great, right? So the Jade Emperor and the Celestial Queen Mother see that, hey, like the moon's been swallowed. That's not great. And they see this giant dog and the Celestial Queen Mother recognizes the dog as Hui's. So she she sends soldiers to go capture the dog. And when she does, the Celestial Queen Mother renames the dog Tiango, which it, before it was just referred to as the Black-Eared Hound. Now it's the Heavenly Dog. And she assigns the dog to guard the Southern Gate of Heaven, but only after it spits out the moon and Chunga. <laughs> I'm sure many pet owners have been in a situation where you're just looking at your dog and you're like, spit it out. Spit it out. Or you have to like kind of out. pry their jaws open and be like, yeah. you cannot swallow that. Come on. <laughs> I know you want to, but you really can't eat the moon. 
before the origins of this story, where it is a part of Chunga and Hue's story, the Tiango was not exclusively depicted as a dog. In early translations, it was said to resemble a fox with a white head, and it was seen as a much more like benevolent form in this way. It is known to ward off evil and is seen as a guardian. A real Alola Ninetales situation. Very much so, yes, but not icy. <laughs> no, not icy, just white. So let's next talk about the Jade Rabbit or the Moon Rabbit. The idea of the Moon Rabbit is fairly common of a theme found in a lot of East Asian folklore. And most historians trace the original story to China, where it then spread throughout the rest of East Asia. How the Jade Rabbit ended up being on the moon, again, starts with the Jade Emperor. So he's doing that thing that a lot of gods do in a bunch of different stories, where he's posing as a starving old man and then begs for food from four animals. There's the monkey, the otter, the jackal, and the rabbit. So I don't know why gods like doing this. Why do gods like testing mortals by being like, I'm an old man, please feed me. I think it's the ultimate in kind of like power tourism, where somebody <laughs> with a lot of power, you know, pretends to be somebody who uh, doesn't have it. Not so they can like, you know, put in a strong social safety net in many cases or, you know, actually fix a problem. But to be like, man, this sure is different, isn't it? It's like undercover boss, but for gods. It really is. Yeah. And again, you know, undercover boss, like, hey, if you're the CEO and your employees are, uh, you know, full time employed and can't afford basic necessities, maybe don't just buy them a car. Maybe raise your minimum wage by 50 yeah. percent and provide health care for all employees. I don't know. That That's would just be great. Me. That'd be great, huh? Anyway, so the Jade Emperor is pulling this undercover god shit. So he asks them, like, hey, can you get me some food? So the monkey goes and gathers fruit from the trees for the old man. The otter gathers fish from the river. The jackal steals a lizard and a pot of milk curds, because that's what jackals do, I guess. However, the rabbit knows, hey, I really can only gather grass and, like, Humans can't eat grass, huh? That's not good for their diet. That's not going to sustain this old man. So the rabbit does what he feels is the only thing he can do. And he sacrifices his own body and no! throws himself upon the fire that the old man had started. He's like, this is the yeah. only thing this old man can eat. My flesh. And just jumps. As soon as he does so, the fire does not burn him. And the Jade Emperor reveals his true form. And very elaborate, it's me, Anastasia, look. <laughs> To honor the rabbit's sacrifice, he sends the rabbit to the moon, where he becomes the immortal jade rabbit, and he is there when Chunga flees to the moon, becoming her companion. And he's the one that is making the immortal elixir for her all the time. So the imagery is always of the jade rabbit with a mortal and pestle that he's just kind of going to town on. Cool. It's very cool. I like that story a lot. So we also see those winged lions that save Fei Fei and Chin and bring them to Chunga's palace. Oh my god, those are so cute. Julia. I love them so much. They were. And they, oh boy, they're buck wild. But they're known as Peugeot. Uh, though usually Peugeot are portrayed as having antlers, which these ones are not. Uh, Peugeot are, if they are female, supposed to ward off evil spirits and they'll have two antlers. And the male Peugeot, if uh, they have one antler, are in charge of wealth and are said to go out into the world in order to search for gold and riches and bring them back to their master. Interesting. And there are two, I guess, a statue of two of them in the village that Fei Fei is from. And so she like pats them on their head as she's walking around as a kid. And I was like, these are going to come back in some way. How is it going to be? And they and do. That. And it's very cute. Uh, I was reading a very funny and informative Twitter thread about this film in order to prepare for it. If you uh, would like to check it out, I will link to it in the show notes. The author was just like, those lions are extremely gay. I don't know what to tell you, but they're very gay lions. <laughs> I was like, okay, I get it. Fair enough. There is also a buck wild story about how the Peugeot took a shit on the floor of heaven. Oh, and the Jade Emperor extremely pissed, as you would be, you know, when your your pet takes a shit on the floor. Yeah, it's also your pet, though. Like it happens. Yes, it happens, but not when you're the Jade Emperor and Fair. it's heaven. So the Jade Emperor spanks them no. so hard that it seals up their butt forever. Okay. And so after that, the Jade Emperor declares that they can only eat golden jewels. So something like this will never happen again. Okay. Very Emperor story. It, it is a powerful energy in that story, <laughs> for sure. I just, there's not enough story where like 
buttholes are sealed forever. I can't list too many. I mean, I was immediately worried about where the waste would go. So I'm glad that the myth also addresses that. Yeah, no, it's like the waste is now in their stomach forever. And I guess they can regurgitate the the gold and silver and jewels at any time. I mean, I guess they just really made their dog into a piggy bank, um, which is not in my mind, ideal, but it is creative. I'll give them that. It is, absolutely. So let's now talk about Mooncakes and the Moon Festival, because obviously Hell yeah. those are very important to the plot here. The festival is supposed to be the one night of the year that the moon is at its roundest, which I like that. Like, we get full moons throughout the entire year, but the idea of, like, the moon at its roundest is very cool and very cute. That's very sweet. And this is really interesting because the word used for round in, I believe, Mandarin is also used for the word for reunion. Nice. So if you've never heard of or seen a mooncake before, it is basically a pastry, usually pressed in a very ornate pattern, like legit, they are beautiful. If you see the film, you'll notice how how ornate they are. And those are usually filled with a sweet, dense filling made of stuff like red bean paste or lotus seed paste. And if you see the picture of a cross section of a mooncake, you'll notice a lot of them have this yellow circle sometimes in the middle. And those are usually the yolks from salted duck eggs and are, as you might guess, supposed to represent the moon. So cute. It's very cute. I'm told that a lot of the like modern generation of uh, Chinese folks and uh, the Chinese diaspora are not a big fan of mooncakes, but... I've never had one before, so I can't tell you. But I saw someone online say that they're the the fruitcake for Chinese people. <laughs> I'm sure there are. I mean, any of any kind of family recipe like that, I think it's it's rare that the way your family makes it is like this is the shit, mm-hmm. and nothing should change. Um, so I I definitely understand that. Chef Melissa King, who won the recent season of uh, Top Chef, made a very very beautiful mooncake and does like cooking lessons and stuff. Ooh. So if you're interested in one chef's modern interpretation, check her out. She's at Chef Melissa King. Ooh, very cool. I will link it for our patrons. The festival also coincides typically with harvest season. So it's used as a time for reunion, but also to honor hard work and the harvest. And round foods are very popular during the festival, again, because of the idea of like completion and togetherness, but also like harvest season food. So like crabs, as we saw in the movie, are in season during this time. And so they're a very popular dish to eat. Makes sense. Yeah. As you mentioned before, I wanted to talk a little bit about the imagery of the white crane that we saw in the film, which is kind of implied to be the spirit of Fei Fei's mother, which is very sweet. Cranes are very popular and important uh, in Chinese mythology. Typically, they are symbolically connected with immortality and longevity, which makes sense given the themes of Chang'e's story. Right. There's also like a whole bunch of different like interpretations if you see cranes in art, like two cranes flying together is supposed to represent the like longevity of a marriage. A crane flying towards the sun is supposed to represent like uh, climbing the social ladder, so to speak. So cranes, very important in art. You can see there's a bunch of articles online about like the breakdown of different art pieces and cranes involved in them. So definitely check it out. It's worth talking about. And kind of like a fun fact to bring us out and bring us into like our discussion at the end here. The China Lunar Exploration Program recently sent a robotic spacecraft to the moon to collect samples and return them to Earth for scientific study. And the name of the mission was the Chang'e 5. No way! Yes. And they like just, they just, uh, are it's like working on re-entry right now damn so it's very cool because it's been gathering stuff on the moon for a while now and it's going to be returning to earth like in the next couple of days probably oh my god i hope someone made a jade rabbit pun or named something jade rabbit somewhere in there (laughs) i really hope so but i think that this is really interesting because it does exemplify what i love most about this film which is kind of the juxtaposition of modernity and ancient tradition like fei fei lives in this very traditional style village but interacts with like the new maglev train that is coming into the area and rather than portraying this new technology as something that will like ruin the area or is going to like disrupt her lifestyle uh, the movie really shows that the new and the old can kind of exist simultaneously and harmoniously and i think that's a really beautiful aspect of the film that extends to fei fei's home life as well she can still have those memories of her mother while loving 
a new family that she has now. And it is in its essence, the film is about moving on, but still treasuring the memories and traditions of the past. And I think that's a really kind of beautiful segue into we our discussion of the film. Absolutely. I wasn't sure at first the time period that the movie was set in. And I realized that that was kind of a, an assumption that I was bringing to the table, at least, you know, someone who consumes, for the most part, U.S. based media, that there aren't a lot of depictions of kind of contemporary Chinese life, particularly rural Chinese life. Um, and so I was sort of assuming that it was set in the somewhat distant past. And then I was like, damn, like that was wrong. Why Why should I assume that? Um, and to see, you know, a maglev train and school and iPads, you know, and like um, this this adorable child who's super into physics and math, you know, use her knowledge and hobbies and ambitions to do this like very sweet, childlike and fantastical mission and hope, I thought was a really lovely pairing. Yeah, there was a beautiful, beautiful song that, again, made me cry. Most of the songs made me cry in this film, for the yeah, record. Yeah, But yeah. there's one where she's, like, talking about, like, scientific... She's just singing about, like, scientific theory and how she's going to get to the moon. And I'm like, I don't understand what is happening here, but I love every second of it. It's very sweet, and you can, like, hear her passion in the song, and it... Yeah. I love it. Also, at one point, she's like, hey, Dad, can I buy a couple of these things for a science project? And then she must have spent so much money, kind of... She's able to like get a couple of the pieces and stuff like that from like the junkyards and salvaging uh, items, but she must have spent so much money on things. I mean, she's like an enterprising kid too. Like she does deliveries and she's been working, you know, with her dad for a long time. So maybe she had some savings. Yeah. And it seems like their mooncakes are extremely popular. So they're probably living like a fairly solid life in terms of money and whatnot. And one thing that I didn't mention in my summary, but I thought was really powerful too, was, um, you know, Fei Fei's whole mission here was like, if I prove to my dad that Chunga is real, then he'll know that like true love is also real. And he, you know, can't let go of the memory of my mom and therefore shouldn't marry anybody new. On the way home, she was so touched that Chin had grabbed a Polaroid that she had taken of her and Chunga, which for her is like, yes, like I have the proof I can show my dad and he will know. And then it burns up on reentry to the Earth's atmosphere. And so A, like obviously that's crushing. But B, it prompted me to think about, you know, the the ways in which physical items from people that we have lost do hold important memories, but also that we don't need those physical reminders for the memory of the person to be real. And there's sort of like, does not need to be proof that something mattered to you in order for it to matter to you? Yeah. And throughout the film, we see first that um, Fei Fei's mother has this like beautiful silk scarf that has a portrayal of Chunga on it. And after she passes away, Fei Fei is wearing it very, very often. And it's kind of used as the one as like a motivation for her to go and find that evidence of Chunga for her father. But also it does, like you said, kind of tie her to her mother's like past and existence and stuff like that. And so I think it is very sweet, but it's not like one of those things where, you know, she lets it float into the breeze as like an acceptance of her mother's death. Oh my God, I was so scared that was going to happen. I thought she was going to give it to the bird to take to the moon. And I was like, no, you need that. <laughs> right. But there is also that imagery of like, she has this little Chunga doll that her mother had given her as well, which she thinks is the quote unquote gift that is going to help yeah. Chunga bring Hui back. And it ends up being destroyed. And I think that that is kind of that representation of like, we have to let go of the things that kind of bind us to our loss rather than, you know, honoring the memory of people who are past, but also letting them go. Yeah. And like, there are just, uh, there's so much here. I thought the idea of like a, a blended family or, you know, a, a grown child whose parent is marrying somebody new, like that is also something that is really fucking hard. And it's hard for me, you know, as an adult, I'm sure it's really hard, especially when you're a kid. Um, and so seeing that, you know, the, the symbolism of using a mooncake recipe with dates versus not with dates mm -hmm. and, you know, Fei Fei at first, understandably being very possessive of it, but then later, you know, realizing that it's okay to blend traditions, it's okay to, you know, have certain things that are the way you've always done them and are meaningful to you and certain things that take on new meaning and making space for those new rituals in your life and new, you know, areas of meaning and of symbolism, I think is really powerful. I also love that, you know, you took us through and that there are, I'm sure for people who grew up with this myth, so many instances of variation. And that's one of the things I love about, you know, studying and learning about other uh, mythologies and stories as we do here, that the stories that we find meaningful say so much about us um, and looking at the differences in 
the like vast differences, you know, in the sort of like emotional reality and consequences of these myths, I think is really powerful because like you need different ones at different times or different societies find it meaningful for different reasons. Or the people who, you know, try to make something canonical might have agendas. And so to see that depicted in the film particularly was fascinating. There wasn't like one version that was definitely true forever. It was complicated. And I loved seeing that acknowledged. That was probably my favorite aspect of the film is this idea that a lot of times when we're retelling mythology in uh, in media like films and TV and stuff like that, we kind of just establish one thing as canon and that's it. And we really don't get the the full story of what happened with Chang'e, whether she took the pill, you know, accidentally or if she took it to spite Hui yeah. or all of that. And I kind of like that they don't ever establish it because lends credence to the idea that all of these stories are true to people and it doesn't matter which story is the right story because all of the stories matter 100 percent. yeah yeah anyway i really like the idea of keeping traditions alive while also embracing new traditions i think that's a very key aspect to this film and the story and I I really like the story of Chung. I like the different versions. I like what they all represent. And I think that there's something to be learned from each version. Totally. And if you have a version that is your favorite, conspirators, please let us know. We'd love to read about it. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, listeners, stay creepy. Stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors at calm.com slash spirits. You can get 40% off a calm premium subscription at brooklinen.com. The promo code spirits will get you 10% off and free shipping and at betterhelp.com slash spirits. You can get 10% off your first month of counseling. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.